firework shows, cookouts, going to the lake, parades. These are all things we do every year on July 4th. But this annual celebration of America's independence goes much, much deeper than that. The French and Indian War was a major event that also involved Great Britain as well in a dispute over the land in North America and would prove to be a turning point in the history of this new land that was being fought over so fiercely. The Boston Tea Party was a protest over the American colonists being taxed excessively without any kind of representation in the British Parliament. Spain, France, Britain, as well as the Native Americans were all making claims on land and were more than willing to fight for this newly discovered unknown land but the colonists already here had their own plans. But who would end up with the land? How would it be divided up? And how it all happened is coming up next. The French and Indian War goes much deeper than the name of it indicates. This war was waged beginning in 1754 and ending in 1763, but was not won by the French or by the Native Americans, also referred to as Indians. In 1753, an ambitious 21-year-old colonial military mind by the name of George Washington was ordered to go on a mission west from Virginia all the way to the Ohio countryside on a specific mission to confront the French forces who were there trying to gain a foothold on that part of what is now part of the United States of America. In 1754, Washington would launch a surprise attack against a small French army at Jumonville Glen. Washington continued wreaking havoc in the area until he eventually was forced to surrender at the Battle of Fort Necessity. This surrender would turn out to be one of the biggest events to ever happen in the history of this young land. Not only did Washington learn valuable lessons that would serve him well in the future, but when he returned to Williamsburg, Virginia in January of 1754, he had with him a very important document that would help to chart the course of history. At that time, Major George Washington had in his possession a letter from the commander of the French army to Virginia's governor, Robert Dinwiddie, stating the refusal of the French army to leave the Ohio Territory. This letter would awaken both British and colonial officials who were also part of the British Empire to the situation at hand. The French Army's intentions to occupy the Ohio Territory as well as to continue to expand their claims to the land in North America. After receiving the letter from Washington, Governor Dinwiddie wanted to reorganize his men into smaller groups commanded by captains as opposed to the larger groups commanded by a colonel. He believed this was his best and safest path to victory. Washington despised this idea and resigned his position and instead opted to volunteer as an aide to Major General Edward Braddock in Alexandria, Virginia. In April of 1755, they would leave to embark on another mission of capturing French Fort de Quesne in the Ohio River Valley that would later become known as Braddock's defeat. Braddock's army, which consisted of 1,400 men, fell under attack around 10 miles from the French fort by an army of 900 Frenchmen, Canadians, and some local Native Americans that the French had been trading with. 977 of the 1,400 British men were killed, including General Braddock. Washington was the only officer to survive the attack and was later promoted to the rank of colonel once he returned to Virginia. Over the next three years, 
many more attempts would be made by the British to capture the French Fort de Quesne, but all of them would fail until finally in the fall of 1758, General John Forbes led his 6,000 man force, which included now Colonel George Washington, as well as many members of the Cherokee and Catawaba Native American tribes to go try yet another time. The very night before the planned attack on the fort, General Forbes learned through scouts that the French had abandoned the fort and burnt it to the ground. So with no opposing force to deal with, the British forces claimed the land and built their own fort just right around the corner from where Fort de Quesne once stood. Upon returning from this mission, Washington once again resigned his position and soon afterwards married Martha Dandridge Custis and eagerly turned to farming at their plantation in Mount Vernon. Finally, in 1763, the Treaty of Paris was signed, which officially ended the war between France and Great Britain. The treaty gave France the land which is now known as Canada. Great Britain would occupy the land east of the Mississippi River, and Spain would occupy everything west of the Mississippi River. Soon after the treaty was signed, King George III issued a proclamation which limited the American colonies to remain east of the Appalachian Mountains in an attempt to appease the Native Americans that were in the area and maintain peace in the region. This would later play a key role as this decision was one the colonists didn't agree with at all. After the war ended, Great Britain was deep in debt and began to impose many taxes on the American colonists in an effort to repay some of those debts. The Stamp Act of 1755 taxed colonists on all forms of paper they used, including newspapers and business licenses. The Townshend Act of 1767 taxed essentials such as paint, paper, glass, lead, and tea. In 1770, the Boston Massacre occurred after a group of frustrated colonists started throwing snowballs at a British guard in the streets, which resulted in five colonists being killed and six more being wounded by other British guards. This would lead to the British doing away with all of the imposed taxes on the colonists, with the exception of the tea tax because of the massive amount of tea consumption by the colonists. An immediate protest broke out by the colonists when they refused to pay the tax, so they instead started buying their tea from the Dutch instead of from the British. This left the British Tea Company with a huge surplus of tea and facing bankruptcy, so in May of 1773, the Tea Act was passed by the British Parliament, which allowed the British company to sell tea to the colonists at a much cheaper price than the other companies, but still tax the tea once it hit the ports. The colonists felt like they were paying an unfair tax that they had no choice in because the colonies had no representation in the British Parliament, which was leading to growing frustration in the colonies. The Sons of Liberty, which were originally founded to protest the Stamp Act, which had since been done away with, which included people such as Benedict Arnold, Patrick Henry, Paul Revere, Samuel Adams, and John Hancock, were leading the charge against the British Parliament's unfair, unrepresented tax laws against the colonists. In December of 1773, the Dartmouth ship, which ironically was built in America and owned by Americans, was to arrive with a shipment of tea from the British along with two other American-made ships also loaded with tea. A large group of colonists held a meeting where they voted not to pay the tea taxes 
when the ships arrived at their ports. Soon after arrival, a large group of men boarded the ship at night and dumped all of the tea into the ocean, which would spark more tension between the colonists and the British, but not because of the actual act of dumping the tea, but because of the reaction of the British afterwards. It also led to many more instances of tea being dumped in many of the other colonies, but the Boston Tea Party was the first one as well as the most famous one. The British closed the port of Boston after this until restitution for the tea had been paid, as well as did away with self-government in Massachusetts and expanded the Quartering Act, which was an act that would allow British troops to be housed in the colonists' private homes in the event that there wasn't sufficient room inside the army barracks in the area. Now by this point, the colonists were completely sick and tired of the taxes they were being forced to pay, as well as the fact that they had no say in the matter because they still had no representation in the British Parliament. So basically, whatever the British government wanted to do is what the colonists had to go by. The early Americans were very religious people and had strong beliefs. The last thing they would want to do is to rebel against the British without believing that they were not only in the right, but that their actions were also justified by God. In fact, eight of the original 13 colonies had established churches already before the war, and those who chose not to practice Christianity or practice a different kind of religion were often persecuted in these areas. Now, organized religion in the colonies of the early days wasn't actually organized at all. In fact, some would even call it chaotic at times. Up until 1760, Anglicanism and Congregationalism were the two main denominations in the colonies. After 1760, though, the Protestants were continuously creating brand new movements in an attempt to establish what the main religion was going to be, such as Baptists, Methodists, Quakers, Unitarians, and many more. Much like today, an area that primarily practiced one belief would see the new denominational congregation as being unfaithful and just trying to stir up trouble. Regardless of which denomination each person was a part of, there was one thing almost everyone everywhere had in common. The heart of each community was always with the church, and the calendar literally revolved around the Sabbath. Even slavery was seen as a religious issue back then and was very much a part of the early American culture. As people were steadily showing up to this new land, the traditional Anglican and Congregational denominations had no choice but to become lenient to other denominations that were quickly growing in different parts of the country. There were people showing up to America from all over the world and brought many different religions with them, such as French Huguenots, Catholics, Jews, Dutch Galvanists, German Reformed Pietists, Scottish Presbyterians, Baptists, Quakers, as well as many others. In the New England colonies except Rhode Island, the primary denomination was the Puritans, who held very strict religious views and standards and even included these views in the laws, mostly in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Their laws actually considered citizens who didn't practice conventional religion to be a threat to society and to be punished for being a rebel. The Quakers were mostly located in Pennsylvania. The middle colonies were a mixture of mostly Catholics, Jews, and Lutherans. The southern colonies were mostly Baptist and Anglicans. The Carolinas, Virginia, and Maryland were mostly known for being predominantly Catholic. 
Sad but true, there was much persecution and even violence among many of the different denominations in the colonies of America. But one thing they could all agree on, for the most part, they all wanted to be a free people, independent, and apart from a Great Britain who they believed to be treating them unfairly and would do whatever it took to make that happen. And that is exactly what would happen in the very near future for those early American colonists. On April 19, 1775, hundreds of British troops marched from Boston towards Concord to try to seize an arms cache. That's when the famous Paul Revere ride took place when he and many other riders quickly sounded the alarm that the British Army was on their way. Immediately, the colonial militia started to mobilize in, to confront the British Redcoat Army. The militiamen were constantly showing up to fight, and eventually the British Army had to retreat. This was just the beginning of a long and fierce struggle in an attempt by the American colonists to declare their independence from Great Britain once and for all. When the Second Continental Congress convened in Philadelphia, they voted to form a Continental Army with George Washington as its Commander-in-Chief. Soon afterwards, the first major battle would take place between the two countries in Breeds Hill in Boston, better known as the Battle of Bunker Hill. Now, although this battle ended in a British victory, the colonists were now more encouraged than ever to fight on for what they believed to be right. For months after that, Washington and his forces really struggled to contain the British in Boston. But then something happened that changed the war. Some artillery was captured in New York that was used to drive the British Army north to Canada and out of New York, for now at least. That July 4th, the Continental Congress voted to declare its independence from Great Britain by adopting the Declaration of Independence, which was written mostly by Thomas Jefferson, but it was a five-man committee in all that wrote the Declaration. But that was by no means the end of this conflict. In fact, it was just the opposite. In response to what the British considered to be a rebellion, they sent a large fleet of ships, including another 34,000 troops, to New York, determined to put an end to this rebellion. And for quite some time, they did just that. The Redcoat Army pushed Washington and his men out of New York and all the way back to New Jersey until Washington formed a surprise attack in Trenton, New Jersey on Christmas night and won. Then, he won again at Princeton, which restored hope that the colonists may actually be able to win this war. The British strategy was clearly to separate the New England colonies from the rest of the colonies, since the New England area had been the most rebellious towards the British. They believed if they could succeed that the war would essentially come to an end and they would maintain control over the colonies. Now remember that army that Washington drove out of New York that retreated into Canada? Well, they were back. They had been planning another attack the entire time. Led by General John Burgoyne, the British Army marched south to meet with General Ho's forces at the Hudson River. The two decided on Ho's forces marching south to confront Washington's army while Burgoyne would remain in the New York area, securing it as well as retaking Fort Ticonderoga, which he was successful in achieving. Ho too was successful in defeating the colonists at Brandywine Creek, Pennsylvania on September 11th and then Philadelphia on September 25th. Washington and his men were forced to retreat to Valley Forge for the winter. 
Now, the move by General Ho, moving so far away from New York, left General Burgoyne vulnerable. And on September 19th, this vulnerability was exposed when American forces under the command of General Horatio Gates defeated the British Army is what is famously called the Battle of Saratoga. Then on October 7th, another victory at Bemis Heights, which was the Second Battle of Saratoga. On October 17th, General Burgoyne surrendered, which gave the Americans momentum as well as led to another huge win for the American Army. Now these victories prompted France to join the war on the American side. This would prove to be the turning point for the rest of the war. In early 1778, the battle in the north had basically turned into a stalemate with battles being fought but no clear winners and it was just going back and forth for the time being. In the south, however, the British were gaining ground quickly. By early 1779, the British controlled Georgia, and in May of 1780, they took over South Carolina. After these events, Washington replaced his losing general, which would turn out to be a great move, as General Nathaniel Greene split his army into two armies and gave command of the other half to Brigadier General Daniel Morgan, and together the two armies pulled off defeat after defeat over the British armies in the South. Now, all eyes were on Washington, and he led the British to believe he was going to attack in New York, but instead he moved south to Virginia, where his army, as well as other American and French armies, effectively surrounded the British army, which put an end to the war once and for all. Great Britain had exhausted all of their resources and had no choice but to surrender. The colonists had effectively won their independence over Great Britain. This is essentially what we actually celebrate on July 4th every year, is the victory over the British Army, which led to the country we now all enjoy and love so much. But the end of the war was just the beginning of the struggles to shape America into what it is today. And this is what we'll be discussing in my next video, talking about the aftermath of the American Revolutionary War. So be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you won't miss that video when it's released. Also, click this next video to see how and when the United States became a world superpower. And thanks for watching.